So, um, what's reactive technologies, Chris? Reactive technologies. So, the thing that we're famous for, particularly in the UK, is measuring inertia. As we've seen the UK grid transition from coal and gas fired generation, which have these big spinning turbines, they're very, very heavy. As we put more wind and solar, we have a decreasing inertia on the grid. We always say the control room back in the day was a bit like driving a steam train. Uh, you've got this very, very heavy machine that's burning a whole load of coal, but it's very stable. It kind of rides through faults. Um, as it gets lighter and lighter, it's a little bit like riding a motorbike all of a sudden. So this is why we need faster frequency response, different frequency response markets, a different design of market to catch that motorbike as it's falling. And yeah, our technology helps to measure inertia. So we can tell a grid, do you have a heavy grid today or do you have a light grid today? How much frequency response do you need to buy? So we're a mixture of hardware and uh, software platform offering. Cool, and um, so reactive technologies has been in the news a bit, um, various, um, uh, well, mostly good news really. Um, you've raised, <laughs> raised a lot of money, you've signed some big deals. And you guys sell, you do a lot of analysis and um, sell information, I think, to mm. grids, like National Grid, is that right? Yes, our core business is selling data to grids exactly that, like, like this. Uh, National Grid ESO is our kind of lighthouse and uh, first commercial customer uh, in the UK. We have a six year agreement with them to give data to their control room. So it's a data as a service kind of offering. And Adars. we're now, Adars, Adars. sure, yeah, Everything's Adars. like a service now. I love it. love it, Yeah, and we're now on that kind of internationalization journey. So we've done uh, pilots outside the UK, in Japan, uh, in Germany, in New Zealand, in a couple of others. Oh, so awesome. There's only one national grid in the UK, so if we want to find another national grid, we have to go elsewhere. And then coming later towards the end of this month, we have an offering for energy traders and for battery aggregators to take that same data source, to take that same understanding of grid constraints that we give to grids, and to be able to give that to the wider market awesome. so they can understand and inform their bidding strategies. Cool. And so um, Reactive Technologies, how long has the company been going for? Um, you've been around for a while in that company, right? Yeah, so I've been at Reactive for five and a half years. Mm -hmm. Um, I joined to run the grid business unit. So five and a half years ago, uh, we'd done two innovation projects uh, with National Grid. The first one was sending signals through the power system. So we put a big load bank, I like a great this. big toaster right in the middle of the grid, and we sent a signal out across that whole grid and we could measure it in any plug socket. So you're um, like modulating across the sign. Is it like, is it, yeah. how, how, how does that work? So the way I was trying to explain it is, think back to the August 2019 blackout. Yeah, where people were stuck on tubes in London in the dark. Don't, don't think about that bit. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> think, well, actually, about, think about the, the physics of the event. So we had a... Who, yeah, we had who a gets one, blamed? We had a one and a half gigawatt power swing. Yeah. If the frequency fell really slowly, that means you've yeah. got a really high inertia grid, but the yeah. frequency fell really quickly, and that shows us we have a low inertia grid. So we do the same thing, but like miniaturized. We inject five megawatts of energy into the grid instead of 1,500. And we take the same measurements. So we're sending this pulse of energy, this five megawatts into the grid. If the grid is really resistant to that signal and the amplitude's very low by the time we measure it, that means it's a really high inertia grid. Whereas if the signal flies through the grid and it's really easy to measure, you've got a really low inertia grid. Oh, I've grid. got so many questions about this. Go so, so you guys inject power into the grid, Correct. Like a little bit, with a certain waveform, and then yep. you measure it around in other places, and then you figure out how heavy or light the grid is in inertia terms, right? Yeah. How do you, don't need, you need to be met, like there's a time sinking problem here mm. over distances. How do you do that? Uh, GPS. So GPS. GPS gives you a very, very accurate timestamp. So we have one location where we're sending the, the, this, this pulse out into the grid. Uh, for the pilots, we use load banks, effectively a, a massive toaster turning yeah. on and off. Very low capex, but you wouldn't want to run that for a long time because you just make loads of heat. By the way, so, for people who haven't seen these things, they look a bit like peaking plant. They're like they're in, um, yeah. they're in containers or whatever, yeah. and it is literally just a, a sink of power. You're you just yeah. using up power to heat the air usually. It's exactly like a toaster. It's a it's resistive a element. It's a wire that gets hot and a chimney to make the heat go away. But no bread. So, but no bread, just the hot air. <laughs> yeah. So great for a pilot and it proved the concept. Uh, but for the commercial service, we're using an ultra capacitor. So it's a form of energy storage that's massively resistant to degradation. Yeah. We are sending a pulse of energy every two seconds, roughly into the grid. 
So we're going to cool. full import, then full export, then full import, then full export every two seconds. And if you go to any battery investor and say, hey, I'm going to do that with your battery, they'll tell you to go away because yeah. you'll have a, a small pile of ash by the end of the year. Whereas an ultra cap, super resistant to degradation. So we built a bespoke asset to provide this service to National Grid. Uh, it will be there for the, for the long term. So we have a six year contract uh, delivering this data uh, from this asset. And uh, uh, yes, that's so the model. Cool. This is so cool. So what does an ultra capacitor, the, the words ultra capacitor mm. get me very excited. Okay. But what does one look like? Well, it looks like a shipping container that says React Technologies on the outside. Right, okay, but yeah. if you look on the inside, if you look at the type of technology, so lithium ion batteries are storing energy in a chemical form. Um, an ultra capacitor is effectively storing energy uh, like static electricity. It's got mm -hmm. two plates and you're storing static. Yeah, uh, electricity on those plates. It's like when you rub a balloon on your hair, it, you've got that static charge held on the outside of the balloon. This is very, very similar. Two plates, you don't get that electrochemical uh, wear when you have this uh, sort of uh, chemical uh, change over time. Instead, you've just got plates and you've got power shifting between those, allowing us to give a, a hard and quick zap into the power system. And it's actually the, the biggest continuously operating ultracapacitor anywhere in the world. For this Love service. it. But not, probably not in the universe. There's probably some aliens with um, ultracapacitors somewhere. <laughs> just the, the words ultracapacitors just makes me think about uh, yeah, interstellar stuff. Yeah, it's a bit something, something a Bond villain would have. Yeah, it is. It <laughs> is. And so who's in the company? Who's the, who are the Bond villains? Um, how many people villains? are there? And um, like, well, yeah, well, tell, us yeah, about, so, tell us about the company. We, we've got 54 people, mm -hmm. roughly split 50-50 between the UK and Finland. So everybody in the UK is from an electricity background. So before I was at Reactive, I was at Open Energy doing demand side response. And before that, I come from the world of consultancy and sustainability consultancy. Mm -hmm. So everyone in the UK is from-, from Probably worth a mention. You, you used to work with Robin, who's, who's uh, Modo Robin now, but that's used right. to be Open Energy. Modo Robin, Robin. Yeah. that's right. Yes, we used to work very closely at uh, Open Energy. So, well, maybe we could talk about demand side response as well later. Yeah, yeah. How this is going. Um, so 54 people, everyone in the UK broadly from an energy background, some power system engineers, some real like deep electricity expertise. Other half of the company in Finland is from a communications background. We have um, real capability in digital signal processing. We've got lots of ex-Nokia engineers. I was going to ask you about and one that there's a few Nokia folks. Yeah, so we're based around. in a town called Oulu. It's about 100 kilometers south of the Arctic Circle. So it's really far north in Finland, which is where Nokia used to have their R&D center. Yeah. And they're deeply, deeply technical folks. It's very dark in winter, so they spend lots of time inside uh, creating software and very high quality engineering. I always say in power systems, we sort of obsess over megawatts and hertz. Mm. And that's like our comfortable domain. A telecommunications engineer obsesses over milliwatts and megahertz. It's the same physics, but it's a very different order of magnitude. And Fourier transforms and the, La the, La the Laplace all domain. Of this, all of this stuff uh, they, they, they obsess by. And there's plenty of problems that were solved in the telecommunications realm many years ago that we're just encountering in power systems now. So if you look at you know, a very uh, light power system, be it Scotland or Australia, you start to see oscillations. So hold on, when you say a light, remind yes. us what you mean by a light. Uh, low, low inertia. Low so inertia. Full of wind and solar makes it very light. You don't have these heavy spinning, spinning masses. machines that yeah. are creating that uh, stability that we used to see for free, but with a whole load of well, let's, emissions let's associated do it. to it. Um, I'm putting you on the spot here, Chris. Yeah. Um, what is inertia? What is inertia? So if you have the, the physics version of it, it's measured in joules, it's energy. And it's the, the, the spinning mass uh, in, a, in, in a power system. You can think of it in a, in, a, in a very similar way to if you're riding a bicycle. If you're riding a very big, heavy bicycle, or mm. I used the analogy of a steam train before, if it's very heavy, it has lots of inertia. So if you're going down a hill and then all of a sudden you're going up a hill, the very heavy bicycle is going to carry you quite a long way. It's going to kind of ride through problems. And we see that in the power system with frequency response. If I've got a frequency event, if I lose 500 megawatts or so, high inertia system, the frequency falls very gently and very slowly. A low inertia system, that's more like your lightweight uh, carbon racing bike, or it's moving from that steam train to that, um, uh, to that motorbike. It's a lot harder to balance. It can be a lot more agile if you control it in the right way, mm. um, but you do have to control it in the right way. So inertia is, is literally how 
heavy the grid is. It's how much spinning mass there is on the grid. And that amount of spinning mass gives it stability or not. And the, the, um, I guess the problem that we're trying to solve here is that spinning mass is uh, generally turbines, right? It's steam turbines or gas turbines yeah. or, yeah, that, that kind of thing. And um, that, that was very useful um, for the last 100 years on the grid because it kept grid frequency and, and high inertia, a very heavy system. But um, we're replacing those technologies with um, wind and solar that are connected behind inverters, right? Or power system That's right. conversion, yep. uh, power conversion units, which are electronics. There's mm -hmm. nothing big spinning. It's no. um, thyristors and things happening, yeah. which is a different world. Yeah. Um, and so we, we Although we've got the same megawatts, we need to replace the other bit, which is the inertia. And um, I guess the first thing to do that is to, to measure it, where you guys come in. Yeah. So before you guys, mm. how was National Grid keeping an eye on inertia? Or every, so every grid glo globally basically has a, a, a model mm. of what they think the inertia might be. So each of the big transmission connected generators are connected into their SCADA system. They can see them in the control room. And they'll make some assumptions about this has a steam turbine that is of this size, and so I think it contains this amount of stored energy. In practice, those generators can shift modes and bring different bits of kit in and out. So their inertia changes a bit, but that's kind of okay. There's also a load of inertia on the distribution grid. So we have CHP engines. We have in every single water utility, there's a whole load of pumps moving water around. That's the thing. Which also provides Motors inertia. are inertia as well, right? If, if it's right. spinning, whether it's generating Con or consuming. Conveyor belts, fans, all this kind of stuff. And in the UK, about 30% of total inertia today is on the distribution grid. If we decommission all of the coal and gas plant, that 30% is going to turn into 50%, 60%, or 100% that's kind of embedded in the distribution grid. We actually did some work in New Zealand, and they said, well, we don't have any heavy industry. You know, we don't have these big spinning motors. So we think there's very, very little inertia uh, in the distribution network. The study that we did, it turns out they have about 18% of their total inertia in the distribution grid. Wow. So even when they think there's you know, nothing there, we just have sheep and tourism, we don't have heavy industry, you know, they still have big hydro plant, they still have water utilities, they still have, I don't know, pool pumps that people have at home. And you've got this long tail of inertia. And the only way to really measure it is this kind of injecting of power in the grid. So we're in the strange position where our, our competition today is our customer. Yeah, yeah. Our customer has a model. They're familiar with the model. They kind of know the model. And we're coming along and saying, we know the grid better than you. So what about the locational stuff? Can you see, is there a way to figure out where the inertia is? Or is it are you just looking across the whole grid Here's my inertia number. I know it's more complicated than this, but um, across the whole grid, this is how much inertia we have. Can you can you pinpoint where it is? You know, there's some in London, yeah. there's some in Scotland, that kind of stuff. Yes, you can uh, measure. We call it regional inertia. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of parcel the grid up into different sections and look at regional inertia. Today, National Grid aren't doing so much optimization on a regional basis. Yeah, um, they're kind of treating the grid uh, globally. The EU is doing a little bit of uh, optimization on a, on a regional basis. Australia is doing quite a lot. They are saying you know, each state has to carry a minimum amount of inertia because it's a, a long, thin uh, a grid and there's sort of a risk of islanding. So we can measure it regionally. We put measurement units in the, in, in, in the right place on the power system to be able to parcel it up in that way. So you can send one signal, but then it propagates in different ways through these different regions to take those, uh, to take those measurements. So are you guys seeing, um, are you seeing, how to answer, ask this question the right way? So National Grid has changed how it's bought frequency response over mm -hmm. time, and we've had a lot more batteries provide frequency response. So I remember back in, when we were probably both working at aggregators back in mm. sort of 2016, 17, yeah. There was um, there was static non-dynamic frequency response or static. There was um, a lot of EFR was just coming in. Yeah, right? EFR yeah. was just coming in. We had a lot of pumped hydro providing secondary FFR, mm. uh, and now you've basically got sub-second batteries providing all of it. So, have you noticed a difference over time of inertia changing because of frequency response and, and all these batteries so, on the grid? So, if you look at let's call it frequency performance, there's kind of different time domains. So. Inertia is really the first 200 milliseconds of an event. Mm -hmm. So even the fastest battery isn't doing anything within that first 200 milliseconds. It's probably taking that amount of time to measure what's happening. 
mm. before it can then take half a second or a second to respond. So inertia itself hasn't changed, but we have seen frequency performance change quite a lot. There will be some battery bots that complain at this, right? Because in, in, um, <laughs> in DS3 in Ireland, you have to do four responses in 150 milliseconds. Mm. And there's some fluent systems and, and other systems out there that are doing it. So there are some batteries that can do it, but they're just not being utilized in that way in the UK. That's very true. And they do get close, but when we're taking the measurements, you can still tell the difference between inertia and frequency yeah, response. Yeah. If you change how our signal looks, you can excite the frequency response instead of exciting the inertia. Mm. So you can actually kind of measure those two different things independently. Because frequency response is relatively easy to measure and monitor, we don't do that today. We focus on that inertia bit that no one's managed to, uh, to, to measure before. But to answer your question, yes, you can see that, that frequency performance change. Uh, when we looked at Italy, one thing that they've done is they've got really, really fast acting response from an HVDC line. And you could see it very, very clearly when the HVDC line went down and the frequency performance just started performing yeah. appallingly in comparison. High voltage, long distance transmission lines, the high voltage dyna um, dynamic containment, Luminec. I used to be an electrical engineer. Uh, <laughs> high voltage uh, direct, current direct current lines. lines right. So they've got one between Sardinia and the mainland that uh, helps with frequency performance, particularly on the island. That's island, not the a bad trip, is there? Uh, go and check that out, put some reactive technologies out there and yeah. spend the week uh, having pizza and pasta. Exactly. Not bad, not yeah. bad. So uh, what about internationally? Which, 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 um, which global grids are, have got lots of inertia and which, which need more of it? Uh, and where are the problems? Or is it across the board, so, everybody's got a problem and you're going to solve it all? <laughs> this is good business. Oh, obviously. <laughs> yes, the last <laughs> Very good business. And, and the world, I'd say, you know, has changed in the last five years. I'd say the picture from when I joined reactive technologies, the mantra was high renewable islands. You know, the UK is an islanded system. We have DC links to our other countries, whereas the EU is a massive, massive copper plate. So it's got a far greater sort of uh, shared inertia over that system. Um, so when I joined five years ago, you know, the mantra was very much high renewable islands. So that would be, you know, UK, including Ireland. Mm -hmm. That would be uh, Australia, for example. That would be ERCOT. Uh, we talked about ERCOT a little bit earlier. You know, although uh, they're part of the US contiguous uh, continent, electrically, they're completely islanded. Yeah. And uh, awesome. actually, when I went to the, to the, to the US and, I di uh, and, and didn't know that Texas was an island, I said, why are they an electric island? And the guy just said, because Texas. Don't mess with Texas. Sure. Do you actually know what it is? Well, it is. I found this out. So I think it's they wanted to avoid the federal regulation. In yeah, there's a few reasons. So there's like some regulatory reasons. Also, the, in Texas, um, we're definitely going off topic here, but here we go. They, it started as um, production of ice, so ice factories okay. um, got together yeah. and started a, I can't remember what it used to be called, um, but they, essentially they started a, um, a group of these manufacturers and started sharing electricity connections between them. Before you knew it, you had a, a grid of ice manufacturers okay. and it grew out of that. Yeah. Um, and then since then, you know, they decided they wanted to just be their own do thing. Do their own thing. And I didn't really realize that job, was kind actually. of the, the nucleus. There's another similar one, which is Japan. Japan has a 50 hertz grid and a 60 Love hertz it. grid, right? Why is that? Well, in, you know, in Tokyo, they were buying one set of equipment and in Osaka, they were buying another set of equipment. In Tokyo, they were buying the British equipment. In Osaka, they were buying the US equipment. And these cities were so far apart, you know, by horseback, yeah, presumably. Yeah. They thought, you know, these grids will, will never touch. So it's fine that we're kind of uh, building separate grids because they were building it for the, the city without, you know, this vision that these cities would eventually grow and become one, you know, huge uh, megalopolis. So you have a 50 hertz grid in the north, you have a 60 hertz grid in the south, and you have, I think it's six different DC back-to-back -back connections to kind of join the grids. And you have, uh, yeah, one massive city that's Tokyo, Osaka. They also have that with metros, though, right? You go to um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you go to Tokyo, you can there's there's a competing metro system. Yes, metro systems, which again I love. You know, well, we have that a little bit in the UK. You know, there's multiple different Birmingham train stations in London. We have a whole load of train stations. True. When private operators built it, but in Tokyo they've really They're taken really it to an extreme. Gone. I love it. We've got massive train stations right next to each other, <laughs> even with the same name in some cases, yeah. which is brilliant. Um, so anyway, we digress. Yes. So um, grids around the world, generally islands, uh, and they've all got a few problems. Yeah. The so, so so five years ago, you know, it was definitely all about high renewable islands. Hmm. Um, whereas the picture has just changed quite quite radically in the last five years. You know, we have discussions now with European grids where they're looking at everybody decarbonizing very very rapidly 
at the same time. So this huge amount of inertia and this huge copper plate that they've kind of taken for granted for so many years uh, will decline much, much uh, quicker. You know, we say in the UK we've had a fast renewables transition, but in reality, it's been 10 years. Uh, we've had some time to get used to it. If we look at the next wave of renewables rollout, if we look at the speed of implementation of wind and solar, it's going to be very, very quick. And I think it's going to be very hard for a lot of grids to keep up and to not be the bottleneck. That's you the know, thing, it's, right? It's, exactly. It's going, to become, it's going to become very, very politically unacceptable for them to say, no, you cannot connect, or yes, you can connect, but I'll constrain you for half of the time. This is not something they'll be allowed to do. So they're really having to kind of push and look at the next generation of technology. It's mad like, that humankind mm. always gets tripped up by um, steep adoption, S-curves of technology, yes. and it gets steeper. It feels steep yeah. now, right? Oh, you know, mm. we're building some, some offshore wind, great. It's gonna get faster. Uh, and yeah. these grid issues are gonna get faster. Same with the, the energy crisis right now and the yeah. decades of underinvestment, we're not gonna go down that route. Um, but yeah, very, uh, always catches folks out and no one's immune, none of us are immune to it. You know, I'm surprised yeah. about it every day. Um, so come back to your product or mm -hmm. products. Reactive Technologies has a few different products. Do you want to just talk us through um, what they do? So the, the first one is measuring sure. inertia. I think we've, I think, have we done that one? And does it have a cool name? That's the most important thing. The overall product for grids is called Grid Metrics. Grid it's called Grid Metrics Inertia Measurement. It does what it says on the tin, right? Metrics with an X on the end, I hope. That's correct. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> so the, the, the main service and kind of the core of our business is offering uh, these inertia measurement services to, to grid operators, mm -hmm. uh, transmission grid operators most of the time. We also have services for distribution grids, and we have a growing kind of portfolio of those uh, globally. Uh, that's measuring system strength, so if you think of inertia as the stiffness of the frequency, it's kind of how my frequency is stable or not. System strength is the stiffness of voltage. And distribution networks don't really care about frequency today. Yeah. Uh, but really they do care about really, voltage. really care yeah, about yeah. voltage and keeping that within bounds. And it's a similar relationship with renewables. We have a declining uh, system strength uh, with more and more renewables on the grid. The spinning mass is what you guys have to invent voltage. a whole new language to describe this stuff to non-engineers, right? About, yes. you know, strong, weak, heavy, yeah. light. Kudos. Kudos. Yeah. And then last but not least, we have this upcoming service launched at the end of this month for, for energy traders, for aggregators, uh, for uh, potentially for asset owners to also get the same grid insight. So to understand the amount of inertia on the grid, which should inform uh, the volumes of dynamic containment that will be bought. Um, the other thing that we offer is event detection. So we've got these very, very, very uh, accurate time-stamped uh, measurement units, which are taking 48,000 samples of data every second, uh, which is a lot of data, that is a challenge. Uh, but yeah. we're able to detect power station stripping and we're able to do that before market remit notices. So potentially traders can get a real insight and they can start trading ahead of remit notices uh, coming out. And because we're doing that by measuring frequency, by measuring public data, uh, it's an absolutely kind of acceptable way to, to inform your trading strategy and to try and get an edge. You know why I love this company, like your company, right? I love, and I love this conversation, it's because it's almost like a reductionist approach to, mm. if we get philosophical about it, okay. a reductionism on, a approach to electrical systems. And really, a settlement period is a cycle, right? Okay. If, you go, if, you go, if you go down okay. low enough, I know there's a load of challenges about that. Yeah. Maybe a couple of cycles. You know, in a moment, it's 30 minutes, or it could be five minutes, or it could be a minute sure. in the future, or half an you know, When you get far enough down on the 50 hertz cycle, you're not going lower than you know, 50 times a second. Yeah. Uh, and I really like the fact that we're, as, a, as, a, as an industry, we're starting to look at this sub-second stuff in mm. detail. And for us, it came from those Finnish engineers. It came from that telecommunications mindset. Um, you know, I remember when uh, the EFR requirements came out and there was second by second metering and everyone said, oh, second by second, that's loads of data. It's really, really yeah. fast and responding within a second. It's incredibly quick. And if you speak to a telecommunication engineer that built video conferencing software, they would tell you a second is a very long time. Mm. It's a very long time for someone to wait and have that kind of satellite delay effect. They live in this realm of microseconds or you know going into nanoseconds. So it's that, it's you that comfort the... zone, and it's it's looking through the looking through the lens. You know, I talked very briefly about you know systems get light and you get oscillations. I mean, telecommunication engineers call this an echo. 
an echo on a phone line is really annoying. An echo very cancellation annoying. is such a known technology and it's very, very well understood. But we go in power systems, <gasps> oscillations are happening. Inverters are kind of bouncing signals off each other. And you go, okay, that's quite easy to tune out. Yeah. Maybe let's start looking at this. And audio geeks as well. Audio geeks yeah. have used this stuff as well. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, it's, uh, it's very, very cool. And I'm glad someone's doing it. Mm. Um, and so who are your customers? You've got National Grid, you've got the grid folks. Um, and then also you're now working with DNOs, right? Have you signed any deals with DNOs? Are you doing pilots? We're doing pilots. There's none we can talk about publicly yet, but there's, okay. a, couple, there's a, couple in the, uh, a couple in the States. So we're on this internationalization journey. We have an office in Melbourne. So I think Australia will be a real hub for us. Mm. Um, they've had a blackout in 2016 due to low inertia, a very, very interesting energy market. We have an office in Dubai. If you look at the, the grids in the Middle East, they are decarbonizing incredibly quickly. Like they're going from naught to 100 uh, uh, very, very quickly. And they're looking at all sorts of other technology investments they can make alongside that. Uh, and then we have the US. And the US is a very, very different market structure. And uh, some of the DNOs are actually very, very forward thinking over there and really want to start trying to understand the strength of the grid where they don't have any visibility. And the strength gets particularly low when you have like a really rural area with long lines and you put a load of solar on it. Because the UK is relatively small, we actually don't have too much of that. We do have some voltage issues, but it's a sort of bigger order of magnitude in the States. So we're seeing a big take up in the States for this DNA offering. And um, the, do you guys have intellectual property? I, I saw um, I, there's a press release you, you guys raised quite, you know, 15 million ish uh, yeah. not too long ago. Um, th th let's talk about the company for a second. So what's, sure. what's, the, what's the vision? Um, mm. And I know you've got a lot of technology. Is that, is that protected? You know, what, what does the future look like for you guys? Yeah, we, we have 200 patents. Uh, which is good going for 50 or so staff. Mm. Right, to keep the patent to staff ratio nice and high. Yeah. Uh, I did not found the business. The business has been going for around 10 years. There were two co-founders, uh, Mark, who's based in the UK, and Heike, who's based in Finland. They had a previous business together in, in semiconductors and in uh, near-field communications. So they kind of defined the chip design for near field communications. As in and you know, Apple Pay or you know, that absolutely. kind of stuff. They, uh, yes, and they sold that business to Broadcom and then thought, what's the next challenge? Energy, and let's look at the engineering. So that's kind of the, the, the seed of the company and that's how we kind of came up with this uh, mindset. Um, you mentioned fundraising. So yeah, we did a, a fundraise in the middle of the COVID lockdown, which was interesting. Mm. You're going to investors and saying, Please trust me, I would like some money, but you've never met me. You've only seen me on Microsoft Teams. So it was tricky and it took a little bit longer than we anticipated, uh, but we got a really good set of investors out the back of it. So we're now backed by Bill Gates Breakthrough Energy uh, Fund. It's a big so, name. Uh, it's a very, very big, big name big indeed. Name. And an amazing process that they put us through. Uh, you know, they sort of said, uh, here is an ex uh, head of R&D for General Electric. He used to have 1,200 scientists reporting into him. Uh, Prove to him that your technology works. <laughs> then I'll talk about your business case. Uh, so you have kind of a real kind of wow. hurdle with them. It was a really interesting process that they ran. Uh, have we you also, met Bill, by the way? You met I Bill Gates? Not met Bill yet. Or Melinda. I don't know whether they do it together or I don't actually I don't know, I don't know anymore. I think Breakthrough Energy is definitely a, a Bill thing. Okay. I think the foundation. Oh, okay. I don't, I've not got into their personal matters. <laughs> do you get a Christmas card? That's what uh, I want to know. No, not yet. You should send a Christmas card. You might get one back the week okay. the year after. That's a good idea. Yeah, we'll do that. Uh, the other investors that joined were uh, BGF. They led the round. They're a financial investor. They've raised money from high street banks. British very, very fund. strong on, on governance. Exactly. Uh, and uh, Eaton as well, who are kind of a strategic ah, yes. investor. You know, they... they Electric bods. Electric bods. They, they make every kind of electrical hardware that you can think of, but they're also having a really big push into software and mm. data. Um, just as we said earlier, you know, everybody has a SaaS or a DAS platform now, and they're making a really big push into that and making some kind of key strategic investments as part of that push for them. Cool. And then um, is your business capital intensive? Is it, you know, um, I know there's a lot of R&D you guys have to mm. do, but do you have to buy a lot of stuff? We talked about um, containerized bits earlier, like a ultra capacitor yeah. or measurement devices. Do you have to build this stuff from scratch or can you buy it off the, sh off the shelf, you know, off a off the container, shelf. you know, anyway. Yeah. Yes. Um, and yeah, does it, does it cost a ton of money? Uh, no. So the, the device that's sending a signal into the grid, effectively we get our customers to buy this. Uh, grids are incentivized to own a large piece of capital and get a return from it. 
Uh, that is the entire model of, of regulated monopoly. So effectively that we build for them and sell to them. Uh, so that sits on their balance sheet, not ours. Okay. Uh, the measurement units, those do sit on our balance sheet, uh, but they're relatively lightweight. Usually with a grid kind of measurement box, it would be a pretty big, hefty thing. You would put it in a, in a substation. You have to shut the substation down while you install it. Uh, again, with the kind of engineering mindset we have, we measure frequency from a wall socket. So we plug into a domestic oh, cool. level wall socket and we measure frequency from that. So it's a plug and play uh, device. Oh, it's so relatively cool. lightweight in terms of There hardware. must be so much noise that you guys have to cancel out. It, it, it's such yes. a noisy, noisy signal. It's an incredibly noisy signal. It's uh, frequency is always described as a random walk and there's a whole load of noise on top of that. And on top of that, you know, we're looking for a needle in a haystack. If you're looking for a five megawatt signal on a 50 gigawatt grid, it's a very, very, very small signal to look for. Because um, uh, to put it in context, um, you can get those, you can get Ethernet over your home um, yeah. home power network, right? Yeah. And you plug a thing into the wall there, plug a thing into the port, thing into the wall there. And whatever they tell you you're going to get, you don't get anything like it. And that's very clever, but it's very short distance. <laughs> um, yes. and, um, and there's no transformers in the way that you yeah, have to try and hop the signal. There's no transformers in the way. And even that, you wouldn't yeah. really want to. You wouldn't really want to rely on it. And you guys are doing it with a tiny signal over yeah. massive distances on yeah. a grid with fifty gigawatts on it. Yeah, and you've got generators banging in and out and smelters banging in and out. But there's a lot of both maybe art and science to shaping that signal, making sure that it can propagate through the grid, making sure that you can extract it from the noise. And then there's a whole load of techniques, uh, including repeating the signal many, many times. Mm. You know, the most basic. But then there's lots of other techniques to extract that signal from the noise. And then lots of other techniques on top of that to kind of get the meaning out of it. Because yes. once you've got the frequency signal, you still need to understand what does that mean in terms of inertia? Uh, what is that signal telling me about inertia? So how it's kind of layers of IP. But you can design a, it's like a fingerprint either end, right? And you can design a fingerprint for a signal with a little box. It's mm -hmm. very difficult to do that with a massive capacitor, <laughs> an ultra <laughs> capacitor. And there, yeah. yeah. It, it, this, so, um, Although mo modern day inverters, are, you, we, you know, we sort of went on this journey and we thought, can anyone really create this signal? And actually an engineer in 10 minutes sitting with an inverter went, you mean this signal? Went, oh yeah, very clever. Oh, okay. You know, the modern kit is very, very good and very accurate, pretty much drawing any shape you want, which has been fantastic for us. Yeah, I remember, I'm going back to my university days, but yeah, fast Fourier transforms mm. in dig digital signal processing, you can, you can basically play, it's, it's how you can, you can, with a hundred quid box, create the sound of a Stradivarius or whatever that is, right? Yeah. It's, the same, it's the same thing. Yes. Um, yeah, digital uh, killed the radio star, as they say. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, and then where's, where's the company going? So you've got these two products plus the, the new one that you're launching soon. Yeah. Um, very excited to see that, actually. That might be very interesting to us and our customers, so we should yeah. talk about that. Uh, and then, um, you know, what's the vision? You know, what, what, where do we go in 10 years, 20 years with reactive technologies? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the job is, Scaling and scaling means a couple of different things. One, you know, we've proven that we can deliver this in the UK. We can do it at scale. We can prove that it works. We get the data to national mm -hmm. grid. Uh, but on the path to a profitable, profitable business, you need to do that more than once. Yes. So part of that is then that, that that international journey, and part of my role as the chief operating officer is, you know, how do we go on that scaling journey? How do we actually deliver this five times, ten times, fifty times? You know, ultimately, we think there will be a, a big demand for this product. And it's a relatively kind of a, a blue ocean space. It's a relatively clear space for us to compete in. Uh, similar with the DNO offering. This uh, energy trader offering, this relatively new one, this is kind of the first then branch into what else can we use this data for? And we have this product going live uh, towards the end of September. Beyond that, we then think there's uses of the platform for a renewable generator that's trying to connect to the grid to understand the power quality, to understand the harmonics. And not only at the point of connection, but maybe also during the course of the, the life of the thing. There was actually a, a fam famous example in Australia. There's a large battery uh, that uh, during the course of a firmware upgrade, they accidentally deleted the droop curve. So it stopped doing frequency response. Mm. And its whole purpose and meaning of life was doing frequency response. Someone got fired. Whoops. Yeah. The regulator took them to court. You know, they didn't just get a performance penalty, they took them to court. So actually monitoring the performance of the asset and the customer could be the grid that wants to monitor the performance of these assets, or it could be the asset owner 
but wants to have a you know double check that you know something hasn't gone wrong. Uh, it's very hard to sort of you know move and change a big spinning asset, but it's very easy to change the firmware mm. of an inverter, for example. So we think uh, there's a whole load of other applications that we can build on this platform. So we're going to scale what we have in multiple different geographies and prove that we can kind of deliver this. Uh, but then we're also going to look at adjacent uh, markets, all related, you know, in energy and electricity. But we think there's lots of different places and there's lots of different uh, parties who would have an interest in grid stability and an incentive to either do something about it or better understand the grid stability to inform their operation. And I guess the more grids you put it on, the more sort of more the more training data you have, if you like, yeah, that's uh, right. to learn what's normal and what isn't. And it puts us in a fairly unique position. If you look at the the GEs and the Siemens and the Schneiders of this world, they build a box and they sell the box and it goes out the door, and the grid has the data. Whereas we're rolling out the infrastructure ourselves because it's lightweight. You can plug it in a wall. We roll out the infrastructure. We own that infrastructure and we have that data, so we can train the models on it. It's not somebody else training models on the data. Uh, we have the data ownership and we're able to build that platform and build that asset. Data's eating the world, it turns out. <laughs> yeah. Um, I want to ask you a very uh, very difficult question to answer, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Sure. If you had to put your finger on you know, the core bit of IP here, because we've talked mm. today about a whole ecosystem of an end-to-end -end solution, right? Which, when, you know, when, you, when, when put together, is very complicated, but it is innovation together. But mm. you've got 200 pat patents, patent, patents also. So what's a, is it? Is it measurement? Is it signal creation? Is it you know, time stamping? Is it hardware? You know, what's the core bit that you're at all costs will protect? So and how does it yeah, work? Yeah, pa <laughs> <laughs> and give us the drawings, the, please. Yeah, indeed, they're in the patent. You yeah. can go and search for them. No, the so you know, IP is very very interesting. In a lot in a lot of industries, you see a huge amount of kind of this incremental innovation. If you look at semiconductors, if you look at you know phones. People are patenting these these tiny little parts of the system. There's a couple of patents we have which are incredibly broad. We have one uh, broad uh, patent with then a whole load of associated families, but the, the broad patent is around the inertia measurement technique. It's the concept of sending a signal to a grid and measuring inertia. That, yeah. that concept of being able to inject the power and take that measurement, that's that's patented as a, as a technique. That's wow. the real powerful one that's kind of at the core. And then we have a number of other families that hang off that, you know, as you said, around how do you form the signal? How do you actually take these measurements? Cool, very cool. Well, um, we've pretty much run out of time. I just want to say okay. thank you, but is there anything you want to plug? Right? This, is your, this is your moment. I, I feel like I've done my plug. We've done your plug. At end of September, I think we've got a, a product coming up, Trade Energy, that will be very, very relevant for your audience. Awesome. And uh, yeah, keep your eyes peeled or ears peeled or it'll be on websites and social media and awesome. uh, get in touch with Reactive. And now my time to plug because I've been told by a Absolutely. producer we've got to start plugging stuff. So <laughs> if you're listening to this, um, you may have seen that we launched thebezjobs.com, um, which is a jobs board for people getting into batteries. Um, we need about 100 times more people into this sector to, just, to, to do renewables and get to net zero. Definitely. So if you're looking at joining the sector and you're listening, please do head to thebestjobs.com. Um, we, while we run the site, we actually don't really, we don't, it's not to make money, it's just to, to, to get to go from zero to one. Um, and do remember to hit subscribe and that's it. So thanks very much for coming on. Thank you.